Okay, good, uh, good day here. We're going to do a lecture 11, and let's get that up and running. So we're going to do a slideshow from the beginning. And we're going to talk about, uh, continue our discussion on open channel hydraulics. And this lecture is a little bit more simple. There's not a lot of uh, difficult material here. Uh, I am going to introduce the slope area method to you, which is a, uh, a forensic method to determine uh, Q from high water marks. after a flood. And it's something that I've done a, a lot of in my career. There's also a, a term that we're going to introduce, which is called conveyance, and we'll discuss that later, but it comes up from the Manning equation. So what is, a, what is the motivation of a slope area? Essentially, uh, the method that we've developed over the years in the USGS and other agencies and people use it, but uh, it's basically to determine the peak discharge uh, at a location when you don't have any actual discharge measurements that you made during the actual event. And so we end up using high water marks and the energy and momentum concepts uh, to calculate the peak discharge. And we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to first give you uh, an example that happened in 2010 where I uh, worked this uh, particular flood. Uh, there were 20 fatalities. It was in a National uh, uh, Forest Service uh, campground called Albert Pike Campground down in, uh, in Arkansas in the Ouachita Mountains. And so we're going to kind of go through that. It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, little presentation here. It kind of drives home the point that flooding can be very devastating. So uh, this is uh, the state of Arkansas, and you've got the uh, Washita Mountain uh, area down here. This is the Arkansas River that goes across uh, through Arkansas. You can see it kind of through here. Uh, Little Rock, uh, actually Little Rock is, uh, I'm trying to pull it up here. Little Rock's about right in here. And this is a very uh, uh, flat area called Mississippi Embayment. It's very flat. Uh, there's a lot of agricultural areas driven through this park, very flat, low left line. Uh, this is the uh, Ozark Plateau. You know, in, in southern Missouri, we've got the Ozarks, and uh, this is the area here that uh, is the southern Ozark Plateau, uh, which is uh, extends down into Arkansas. This is the area called the Boston Mountains, very beautiful area of Arkansas. And so uh, the Outer Pike Campground is right down here. And so uh, what we had is uh, we'll talk about it more when we get into hydrology, but uh, when you have a moisture flow off of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it's coming in over this flat area and all of a sudden it hits this orographic feature of the uh, Washita Mountains. And so in the uh, rising up of the air mass, you can sometimes uh, get a lot of uh, extra rainfall dumped because as the air mass rises up, it cools, condenses, and water falls out. And so you can have areas of severe flooding in this, in this area right here. Uh, this is a drawing of the watershed on the Little Missouri River. This is where it happened in Albert Pike. And so this is the Little Missouri River that you're shown here. And we've got a USGS gauging station at Langley, Arkansas. The Albert Pike campground is up in here. And so in this area, uh, we did not have any gauging information. And so we needed to go in after the flood and determine what the peak flow values were at various locations because there were so many people killed. So this is just a, kind of a, a rendering of the uh, topography there. It's not the Alps, <laughs> but you can, it, it shows an interesting point in that the uh, valleys of these streams, this is the little Missouri River that kind of courses through here, and it has several feeder tributaries, uh, Long Creek, Briar Creek, and some others. And you can see that the valleys are very narrow and the, the slopes on these valleys are very steep and they just basically uh, pour in the water. And so you get rapid rises to the, the streams in these areas. This is the rain uh, event. This is a, a plot I put together from the NEXRAD radar information. And you can kind of see this precipitation happened 
Oh, in the overnight air hours between 11 p.m. and like four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, the peak of the flooding was uh, up around four or five o'clock in the morning. And, you know, when people were asleep, et cetera, in this campground. And so you see a lot of devastation. So uh, this is this USGS stream gauge uh, downstream at Langley, Arkansas. And this is quite a ways downstream. And actually the valleys, you can see here from the picture, uh, are not that steep that we had up where the campground's at. They're still steep, but, but the, this is a, a rescue crews in Zodiac boats. They're still looking for people. Uh, I was down there right after the flood uh, happened it overnight, and I was down there the day, actually 40, within 48 hours of, of the devastation, and they're still looking for bodies and people. And so you look here at this uh, rate of rise. I mean, we're talking eight feet an hour uh, down at the uh, gauging station, which is, uh, we, we anticipate that the, uh, we estimate, or I have estimated, that the rate of rise was even greater up in the campground area where people were killed. When I got down there, and this is what I encountered, you've got a lot of the national uh, news media uh, at this uh, check-in point, and they're not letting anybody down in the, in the campground area where people got killed. This is a, 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 a command post that was run by the uh, uh, Arkansas uh, Highway Patrol and the United States Forest Service. And so I daily had to check in up here before I was allowed down into the campground area with special permission. So this was, it was kind of a circus atmosphere. Uh, for several days. Uh, when I got down into the campground the first days, I started shooting photography and photographs. And you can kind of see these, uh, these vehicles. You can see uplifted, uh, um, you know, these concrete uh, pads where they had like, um, you know, barbecue pits and, and parking areas for RVs and stuff. It was a very nice uh, campground at one point. And you can see what happens to the pavement. I mean, the velocities in these areas were very, uh, fast. Uh, people were in their RVs. This is something common that you see in a search and rescue operation where people, uh, the rescue operation will come through and do a primary search of the, of the, um, of, of the building or in this case an RV. And this X here with the zero says primary search has been done. There's been no uh, casualties found so far. But you can see kind of the devastation and let me kind of pop through here. Here's some more. You know, by the time these people uh, realized that it was flooding, their RV was already washing downstream. And so you can kind of see, uh, it's probably, uh, this was in June, so had the air conditioners running and, and it was nice and pleasant. And, and so, uh, you know, well, I guess warm, but nice and pleasant inside because they have the AC. They don't even know what's going on, what hit them. Uh, downstream of the part of the uh, campground, there was a private area which had the, uh, uh, cabins, and you can see uh, some of the cabins washed off their foundations. Here's one completely gone. Uh, it was up around here, and so this gives you an idea of how high the water got, and it just washed this cabin completely away. Oh, by the way, this is the this is the Little Missouri River out here. So it's not this huge uh, river. It's a fairly tranquil-looking stream uh, at low flow, and it looks nice. But uh, you can see the devastation that can be had. Uh, it's just some more. Here's an overturned car. You see a lot of broken limbs. This was very, very common. So uh, we brought down a crew. I brought down two crews, one out of Rollin and one out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and another one out of Little Rock, and began to do some surveys in the campground area there to determine, um, you know, with the idea we're going to be after the peak value of the discharge. And so we set up survey uh, teams, and we surveyed cross sections where we could get the channel geometry and we're surveying in the high water marks. This picture is a very good one here. You can see, look here, these are the, you know, the little Missouri River is going through here. Look at the, the peaks of these, uh, the surrounding hillsides, very steep valleys in these areas. So the water, when it uh, come down in the form of rain, the soils are very thin, so they ran off uh, very quickly into the receiving stream. Uh, and this is a photograph uh, of a restroom and part of the campground. This part of the campground was under construction at the time, so it, wasn't ha it didn't have anybody in it that got uh, killed. But, but you can see this is a bathhouse down there, a finished bathhouse. And so this is a, a refrigerated uh, trailer being used as a temporary morgue by the search and rescue teams. And in, when I took this picture here, you can see that they already found all the bodies in the, and the morgue had been, you know, the refrigerated trailer had been, mit, uh, been moved. But this white line here was the approximate high water mark. So you can kind of see 
uh, the stream is out here. We've got this flat area, and then it immediately goes up into upgrading here in the in the in the, the, um, the hill slope. And so, uh, you know, the interesting uh, thing was, or the question was, what was the flow rate? And then as the as the uh, uh, the lawsuits and everything else start happening, could a, a person that was had their wits about them could they have swam out of this? And uh, you know, what were the velocities that we see here? And so. Part of the modeling I did was to not only get the peak flow value, but also kind of estimate what the velocities were in these overbank areas. So one of the things that I did was I took this uh, bathhouse right here, and I went down with one of the survey teams, and I used it like a pitot tube, uh, where if you think of a pitot tube on an airplane, or you've used it maybe in, in, seen it in the lab, but basically what it does, you, you should have talked about this in, in fluid mechanics, but a pitot tube, if I've got flow uh, out here and I insert a pitot tube into the flow at the point where the flow intersects the front of the pitot tube, this pitot tube is open. So let's say this is the water surface. This pitot tube will cause a stagnation pressure and that velocity gets converted into a value uh, that is a, a pressure term that rises above the ambient water surface. And so this in essence is v squared over 2g. And so I wanted to use the bathhouse as a, uh, a sort of pitot tube because uh, when the water is flowing through the, the uh, channel and going uh, uh, into uh, along this flow line, it's going to hit this bathhouse and, and go to zero. At this location of the bathhouse, it's going to be zero. So if I know what the runup is on this, which we had got marks from the uh, uh, Forest Service and the Arkansas Highway Patrol folks, they told us exactly, and I, I took a magic marker and marked on the front of the building here to know exactly where the water line was, the high water line was. And then I went into this area here, I sent my survey team into this uh, door here where the, um, where the utility area was for the power and, and things like that. And I could get a surveyed high water mark. And you can see that the debris line here on the wall and so if I look and I've got a debris line in here, maybe it's this elevation and this elevation out here, the difference between these two is sort of like my pitot tube. And I could raise that, you know, or I could assume that's the velocity head, the V squared over 2G. That's the run up on the bathhouse. And I use that not to, you know, basically to, to, uh, to do my formal uh, high end modeling, but it's sort of a check to see if whether my model is in the uh, order of magnitude of, of you know, is it, it, are my analysis, is it, is it uh, rendering me a, a, a reasonable value? And this is just a way to check it. And the velocity that we calculated uh, based on this pitot tube exercise was about nine feet per second. And this, uh, uh, the model, when I, when all was said and done, you know, and I wasn't basically making the model say anything in particular, I wasn't trying to get a particular number, but when I compared it, I came up with a value of 8.8 feet per second in the model. So with an independent value of velocity, I felt really good about what my forensic model is telling me in terms of velocities. The other thing that I uh, did was look at uh, ancillary indicators. In talking with the Forest Service folks, uh, I found that this big boulder here, which had an intermediate diameter of three feet, uh, was originally over here and it had been forced by the movement of the water to move almost 100 feet from one side to the other. Here's some additional boulders that got moved around. And so we can look at these kinds of things and we know what kind of shear stress does it take to move that size of a boulder. And if I calculate the shear stress as gamma R S sub F, I get a backdoor calculation of my friction slope further uh, if I know that tau zero is equal to rho c sub f v squared, I can look at some of these things and say, what kind of velocity would it have taken to move this kind of boulder? And so I have a, an additional ancillary indicator of my, of my model uh, values of velocity. These are just some additional uh, shots in the, in the, um, that I took down there. This was a park bench that had been right here Erase that. It was originally, well, it still is right there, but you can see that uh, basically the velocities uh, mined all the gravel deposits out of this particular part of the channel 
and just piled them up on the bench. And then also, uh, according to people that had been down there prior to the flood, it was a newly exposed boulder. So, um, you know, you can see the devastating power of these, uh, these kind of floods. So let's th think about this in terms of, of, of trying to forensically determine the discharge. And we use something called the slope area method. And it takes advantage of using the Manning equation. And uh, this is the Manning equation. And I want to point out a definition here. We're going to uh, call something the conveyance, K, which essentially is the 1.49 over N A R to the 2 thirds. And so that is the conveyance value. It's just basically this right here in the Manning equation. And so uh, when I'm doing my, um, uh, my slope area method, I'm using the Manning equation and I am uh, essentially calculating all the conveyance by things I observe. I go in and I estimate the end value from what I observe down in the stream and then I've got high water marks and the channel geometry and I calculate a, uh, R to the two thirds. The only thing that I need left is to calculate or estimate the friction slope in order to calculate this value of Q. And so as I look through here, I'm going to estimate my friction slope based off this equation. So if I go through and I've got my surveyed high water marks downstream and upstream, um, I've got a, 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 an estimate uh, of, of, the, um, of the water surface. And so I've got the water surface upstream, I've got the water surface downstream. This is nothing more than the energy equation. Okay, where I talk about, you know, we've got uh, uh, V squared over 2G uh, at location one plus uh, Y1 plus Z1 is equal to V2 squared over 2G, and I'm gonna put the alpha value down here, uh, plus Y2 plus Z2 plus the head loss due to friction. And we also have to add another thing, the head loss due to expansion contraction. We're gonna add that in too. And so if I combine these two, the depth plus the value of Z, I end up coming up with a value of the water surface elevation upstream. And that's what you see here. So this is W. And then the water surface elevation downstream is the Z two plus the Y2, that becomes my Y downstream. So this again, this would be the Z1, this is the Y1, and then the whole thing here is the W, oops, oops, sorry about that, is the WU. And so you can see that um, I put this in here and I've got um, um, these two values. And then uh, I'm going to, use my velocity heads, they're right here. So these are the velocity heads at each in, in, in location. And then this right here ends up being my estimate of the, the uh, head loss due to expansion contraction. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the, the difference in the velocity heads and notice the absolute value uh, bars here. So I take the absolute value of the difference of velocity between upstream and downstream multiply by a coefficient k. And that coefficient uh, is going to be given, you have to estimate that based on whether it's expanding or contracting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And so this is going to be my equation that I use to estimate the friction slope. Because remember, the Q is equal to k, S sub f to the one half. Where the k is the conveyance, the S sub f is the friction slope. And we're, we're basically using this uh, equation to estimate that. Now, to begin with, I don't know going down there, I survey the high water marks, I get the channel geometry. I really don't know what the uh, velocities are, either upstream or downstream. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to uh, start off with uh, understanding this. So I'm going to have to make a first cut estimation. So I make a first approximate value of the friction slope. And I'm going to leave everything else off. I'm not going to worry about what the velocities are in this, in this part of the equation. I'm not going to worry about this area here. Uh, let's erase this real quick. So if I want to make my first cut at this approximation, I'm going to basically just cut this stuff out and not even worry about it on my first approximation. And I'm simply going to use the friction slope being uh, the upstream water surface minus the downstream water surface 
divided by this distance between them. That's my delta x. On the previous slide, I used L, okay? But here we're going to use the delta x. And so that's going to be my first approximation. And from that first approximation of S of F, I'm going to plug it in there. I've already got my K, and I'm going to calculate a Q. Now, once I have that first approximation, then I can go back and then calculate the velocity upstream because what V upstream is equal to Q over the A upstream and V downstream is equal to Q over the area downstream. And so I can plug these in into their appropriate locations there and there. And then I get a second computation of the friction slope. If that value goes in into the, the, now I take that and I calculate Q is equal to K, S of F to the one half, I'm going to get a new value of, of K, of Q. And so when I get that value of Q, if it matched my first value of Q under my first approximation, I'm done. If it doesn't, I take that Q that I just computed here and I do the whole thing again. I just repeat it uh, and I go over and over again uh, going after the value of Q. So let's talk a second about these K values for the expansion contraction losses. And so we use this value of K, it's right in here. And so uh, when we have this uh, computation, we end up using, uh, this is from the old maze textbook. We no longer use this, so disregard this part of the slide. Um, we go through and we end up basically uh, taking the value of K uh, based on whether it's an expansion contraction. USGS assumes the following. If it's a contracting section, which means that the cross section is getting uh, uh, smaller, that's, got le that's more efficient, so you get less loss from expansion contraction. We're going to assume it's zero, so we're going to assume it's negligible. If it's an expansion and we always have bigger losses in expanding sections, we're going to use a value of 0 0.5. For most of our cases, when I look at these things from a technical standpoint and I review people's uh, work or I go down and scout out sites after a flood to look for places to determine discharge, I'm always looking for places that don't have expansions. I'm looking for them to be either fairly uniform in their cross-sectional area or to be slightly contracting. All right, that concludes uh, lecture 11.